remain standing we're gonna read our scripture of the year if you're new here we start every year off with a word we come around a word and our word for 2024 is unshakable unshakable we've been saying that a shaky world needs an unshakable church and that comes straight out of scriptures in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 28 and 29 and check this out we've been reading this verse every single Sunday since January since January uh, but this is our first time to read it at the factory so I think we should uh, put a little volume in it today Hebrews chapter 12 verses 28 and 29 now if you're new and you see somebody just saying it off the top of their head they've been practicing since January don't be impressed okay <laughs> but we got it on the screen but come on can we read it collectively as a family you ready you ready all right, here we go. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He is actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn. And he won't quit until it's all cleansed. God him is fire you sound good at the factory today and then one more few more verses a whole lot of more verses exodus chapter 3 this is where we'll take our thoughts from today exodus 3 starting at verse number 1 and i'm gonna go all the way down to verse 14 because you said to the lord in your quiet time you wanted more scripture so here you go Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse number 1, and it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. You know, that's exactly how God sounded that day, some bass in his voice. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Somebody in this service needs to just pause and take that word right there. How many of you know that God is concerned about your suffering? Don't let the enemy lie to you and make you think that God is distant and he doesn't care. He is concerned about your suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Parasites and Hivites and Jebusites and Termites, all the ites are there. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. That should have been the end of the conversation. God said, go. Moses should have gone, but you know how Moses is. He's like some of us. We hear the call of God on our life. You got a whole explanation about how come it can't be done and why. And so look at that. We got to go all the way to verse 11 and all the way into chapter 4 because Moses has a rebuttal to the call of God. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. Ooh, 
y'all don't know how to respond to when the Bible is saying good stuff. He said, when you have brought the people out of it. He didn't say if you bring them out of Egypt, when you have. In other words, I already got a destination for you. It will come to pass. It's not if you make it to the end. It's when. He says, when, 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 when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose, he got a hypothetical, suppose <laughs> I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Can you say amen? Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good stuff. I want to preach today not long, not long, maybe two and a half hours. I'm playing to the guest. <laughs> using, this, using this as a title, the answers in the question. The answers in the question. For the last time, look at your neighbor, whichever one you like the best, and just get in their personal space and place and say, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. The, answers the answers in the question. If you believe God could speak at the factory, would you give him some praise in here today? <laughs> Lord, speak to us today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The answers in the question. How y'all doing up there in the balcony? All right. You know, if the rapture happens during service today, y'all get into heaven before us. So, <laughs> the answers in the question. Make no mistake about it, one of the basic fundamental attributes of God is his sovereignty. Social, your God is sovereign. He possesses all power absolutely. He rules and he reigns sovereignly. When I say that God is sovereign, it means that he has authority without any accountability. Think about that just for a moment. That God has authority without any accountability. That would be dangerous for any other person to have authority without accountability. If you have a teacher that has authority without any accountability, get out of that classroom. That is a dangerous classroom. If you have a pastor that has authority without any accountability, get out of that church. That is a dangerous church. If you have a president that has authority without any accountability, get out of that country. That is a dangerous country. But here's what I love about God. It is so safe for him to have authority without any accountability because he is sovereign. He is God. That means he can act without answering to anyone or anybody. Your God is sovereign. Let me just take a few moments and brag on the sovereignty of our God. He is omnipotent. That means he has all power. He is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere at the exact same time. He is omniscient. That means he is infinite in all awareness, understanding, and insight. It just simply means he knows everything and everything. Your God is sovereign. He is is immutable. That means he cannot change. He is eternal. That means he cannot die. And the reason he can't die is because he was never born. And the reason he was never born is because he was before the beginning. He is a sovereign God. He is Imminent. That means he is among us. He is transcendent. That means he is above us. Your God is powerful, has all authority in his hand. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He is sovereign and he rules and he reigns and he answers to absolutely no one. As a matter of fact, your God is triune. He is three 
wrapped up in what? You know, sound effects make preaching better. He is three, wrapped up in what? The cohesive community of the Trinity. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. As a matter of fact, if the Trinity wanted to release a song to articulate their distinction from humanity, the lyrics of the single would be very simple. It would say, they not like us. They not like us. Because we are different. We are sovereign. Some of y'all too saved. You didn't like that. So let me say it another way. He has all power. He has all authority. He has no rival. Nobody can compare to the sovereignty and the power of our God. Oh, if there's anything he needs to be done, how many know he can do it by himself? If there's anything that he wants to happen in the earth, he can make it happen by himself. As a matter of fact, let me tell you this. God don't even need me to preach for him. Can I tell you, I love to preach. I love to preach. I was created to do this right here. But the reality is, God don't need me to preach for him. He doesn't need anybody to preach for him. This is a God who was speaking all the way from the book of Genesis. The first thing you read in your Bible is, in the beginning, God said he spoke he doesn't need anybody to preach for him he can say whatever he wants whenever he wants to say it oh, as a matter of fact oh this is gonna mess some of y'all up he don't even need anybody to worship him that messed some of y'all up I know I know because you got up today on this Sunday and you're like oh God is gonna be so happy with me all oh, the angels are gonna start rejoicing because I got up today and I got in the traffic and I walked all the way in deep Elm on a sketchy street to come to church I know I heard you I heard you you're like oh I'm gonna get extra bling and my crown in heaven because I did God a favor usually I lift up one hand but oh I lifted up two hands today God is feeling real good please don't get it twisted. Your God does not have an inferiority complex. He is not in heaven going, oh, I'm so glad they gave me praise today. I really needed that. No, no, no. Worship is not for him. Worship is for you. There's something that happens when you open up your mouth and you give him glory. But he doesn't have an inferiority complex. As a matter of fact, if you didn't say anything to God, the rocks would start crying out and giving him praise. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Can we interrupt this service with a little praise break? I need somebody that understands that praise is for you just to take about 10 seconds and give God the best praise that you got because it ain't really for him. It's for me. When I give him praise, there's something that happens in my life. Oh, God. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He has never needed anything. This is what scholars call the aseity of God. He existed in and of himself. If there is a place where God is not, that is a nowhere that does not exist because he was before the beginning. He created all things and he consists of all things. Let me just say it plainly. God don't need help from anybody. <laughs> he doesn't need help from any of us. Anything he wants to accomplish, he can do. Anything he wants to make happen, he can make it happen himself. Which brings me to this question. Why then does he call people? If you're a God that stands outside of time and is in eternity and you exist in and of yourself, why would you ever call anybody to do anything for you? I'm going to keep it 100, social fam. If I was God and I didn't need anybody nobody would get a call. <laughs> I would not call you to do anything for me if I was God. I'm going to be real honest with you. As a human, I struggle with people doing stuff for me because I don't want you ever to start acting funny and think that I need you to do anything. I can get my own coffee. I can drive here myself. Don't start getting it twisted. I would not call on you to do anything if I was God. And yet God, who doesn't need anything, why does he call people? Why does he call people? I'll tell you why he calls people. Perhaps the answer is in the question. God doesn't call people because he needs people. He calls people because he invites you to participate in his purposes and his plans in the earth. God gets pleasure 
in your participation in his purposes and his plans in the earth. He's already going to do what he wants to do, but in his love and his grace and his mercy, he invites you to participate in his purposes and his plans in the earth, but he doesn't need you to do it. He is inviting you to participate. Somebody say, participate. Yeah, that's why God calls you, because he wants you to participate in his purposes and his plan. Oh, let's be clear. His purposes. His plan. Because <laughs> some of y'all are like, well, uh, if he invited me to participate, how come the business is not popping off? How come it's not happening for me? I would encourage you to really check whether that is God's plan for your life, because he does not co-sign your plan. <laughs> Oh, I lost the whole church right there. I know you want God to co-sign your plan for your life, saying, God, here's my 10-year vision board. Here's what I want to happen. Now, I just need you to co-sign. That's not how he works because he is sovereign. He will invite you to participate in his purposes and his plans, but he's not going to co-sign a purpose and plan that you want to happen just because your Instagram page just went live. <laughs> he will invite you to participate in his plan. God works like this. God works like this store that I'm so glad that my kids have grown out of. And they need to take this store out of malls because I don't like this store. Do you know how much time I wasted in this store? But it's exactly how God works. God works like this little store, maybe you've seen it, called Build-A-Bear. <laughs> have you seen this store? Oh, it drives me crazy, and I'll say that on record. Sue me if you want. I hate build a bear, okay? I would rather buy a bear than build a bear, okay? Have you seen this store? I I've been there several times with all of our kids. You walk to this store. It's always a long line as you're walking through this store. It is the dumbest thing. You walk in this store, and your kids are so excited. Like, oh, build a bear, build a bear. I'm like, oh, here we go. I've been in this line about 45 minutes. And you go through, and they pick out the skin. You should see it. It's just the skin of an animal that will be stuffed later. It looks pathetic. Just, just the skin of an animal. It reminds me of probably how Adam looked when God formed him before he breathed the breath of life into him. All the skin just, just hanging there. And then you pick all the skin. Just pick the skin that you want. And then they got little outfits and they got everything. They got hats and shoes. Little bit of shoes like this. Cost about $3,000. Just a little bit, little bit of shoe. And they pick all the clothes for you. And then they take you and your excited child all the way up to the stuff part and there they are and they're putting their foot on the pedal and they're stuffing the little thing and the kids getting so excited I'm like really we've been in this store three hours and they're so excited and then they take this part they take the little heart of the stuffed animal and they give it to your child and says all right let's make it come alive and they hold the heart and they spin around three times and kiss it or something like that and then they put it there and then all of a sudden once they stuffed it they hand to you what you could have bought in the first place and then your kid has the nerve and audacity to be walking around the mall talking about, I made this. <laughs> really? You made that? If you didn't have the stuffing, if you didn't have the skin, you wouldn't be able to make that. And I wonder if God laughs at us sometimes as we hold up our little trophy saying, I built this business. I built this company. I built this church. Who created you? Who gave you the mind? Who put the breath in your body? Who gave you the intellect? Nobody can get the glory for anything except for our great God. Anything he did, it was his power. Oh, not yours. Some of y'all still see it because you think it was you that made the purposes and plans of God come to pass. But I wish I had a church that knew if it had not been for the Lord, oh, I don't know where I would be. It was his grace. It was his mercy. It wasn't my hustle. It was the Holy Spirit working through me. It was him. It was him. It was always been him. Your life at best would be like that skin at Build-A-Bear. <laughs> Until God gets a hold of your life. Anything he's going to do in you and through you is because he's given you, watch this, an invitation to participation. He takes pleasure in inviting you into his call. Which brings me to my text today. In Exodus chapter 3, we are privileged to eavesdrop into the call of Moses. Moses. How many know you got to put some respect on his name? Moses. I don't know if there's a VIP section in heaven. Oh, 
what if it is? Moses is up there. Moses, David, Abraham, they are in the VIP section of heaven if there is one. But surely Moses is in a category all by himself. Moses, the preeminent prophet of the Old Testament. Moses, who gave us the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses, the one that God chose, watch this, according to Numbers chapter 12, to speak to him face to face. He had a unique and distinct relationship with God that no other prophet had. The Bible says other prophets God spoke to through visions and dreams and riddles. But with riddles, but with my servant Moses, I speak to him face to face. Moses FaceTime God. <laughs> oh, think about that. You, you know in your phone you got levels of relationships with people in your phone. Come on. It's like there's people that can text you. <laughs> there's people that can call you. And then there's that can FaceTime you. And it's an unspoken rule. You ever had somebody FaceTime you? There's just only a text relationship. You're like, oh, don't FaceTime me. I mean, you weren't even a compromising situation. You could have answered, be like, oh, you text them right back. Can I help you? <laughs> FaceTime me? Oh, intrusive. <laughs> Moses. Moses had FaceTime relationship with God. FaceTime. God called him and said, guess what, Moses? I want to use you I'm inviting you, rather, to be an instrument through which I will deliver my people. Moses, don't get it twisted. I'm already going to do it. I'm just using you as an instrument to bring about the deliverance. Okay, let, let's just look at it plain in the Bible. He says it so plainly in verses 7 and 8 in Exodus chapter 3. Look at how clear God is. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land and a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says this. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Do you see how clear God is? He's like, yo, I'm going to do it. I'm just inviting you to be the instrument through which I do it. You would think that if Moses got that call, come on, you would think if God shows up to you and says, guess what, Moses, you're about to be the one. You're going to be the one that walks right back up into the palace in Egypt, and no matter what song they got going on, you get to kick the door open with your Birkenstocks, walk right up in there and say, cut that music off, Pharaoh. God said, let my people, Moses, you get to do that. Moses, you're the one that's going to go up on the mountaintop and the glory of God is going to so permeate you that you're going to come off the mountain and you're going to be glowing and people are going to know that you met with God himself. Moses, you get to get the Ten Commandments. Moses, you're the one that gets to take the staff, throw it on the ground. It's going to turn into a snake and you're going to pick it right back up. It turns right back into a stick. Moses, you're the one that they're going to make a movie about out, and as you face the Red Sea and Pharaoh's coming after you because the enemy never wants you to have real freedom. He don't mind you shouting in church. He just don't want you free. And right when he's coming back to get you, Moses, you're going to lift up your stick and the water's going to split and people are going to walk out of slavery into sonship, out of bondage into freedom, out of darkness into light, out of death into life. Moses, you get to do that. Think the response to that would be, hey, yo, <laughs> let's go. It wasn't Moses' response. His response was not a let's go. <laughs> it was a, oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. As a matter of fact, that is often the response to the purpose and plan of God when we hear it, isn't it? Rarely when somebody is called by God do they have a, I'm ready. I'm the man, I'm the woman for the job. If that is your feeling, I dare say that is not the real call of God on your life. Because that call ought to make you so scared that your knees will shake. And you'll go, God, ain't no way this is going to happen unless you help me. Most of the time when God truly shows you what he wants to do in you and through you, it's not a let's go. It's a, oh, no. It's a, oh, no. How do you know that, Pastor Robert? Because when he called me to plant this church, it was not a let's go. <gasps> It was a, oh no, don't forget who your boy is. I'm the one that traveled for 16 years, got to preach at churches, and then guess what? Leave. <laughs> it was beautiful. I'm like, oh, work on that discipleship. Wasn't that a great message? 
I told God I wasn't going to plant a church. And isn't it funny? The thing that you think you won't do, he'll call you to. And generally, the response is, oh, no. Actually, let's be very specific. Moses answered God with a question that he had been wrestling with his entire life. He answered the call of God with a statement that can only come from deep-seated insecurity. He answered God that, with a question that really comes from human frailty because you know your issues and your idiosyncrasies. He answered God with a question, hear me, that somebody is wrestling with right now. Here's his response to the call of God. Who am I? God, who am I to go to Pharaoh and set your people free? Who am I? Has anybody in here ever asked God or yourself a oh, who am I question? See, why y'all do that to me? Y'all act like you just, some of y'all are like, oh, no. You see, you in church, you got your little perfect church face on, and you're like, like, you always got confidence, and you always stand on the word of the Lord. But can we be real in here today? Has anybody ever said to God, who am I? Who am I? Who am I to raise these kids? Who am I to lead this business? Lord, help me. They think I know what I'm doing. Who am I to go to college? Nobody in my family got anything past the GED. Who am I? This is often the question that humanity asks whenever we face the plan and the purposes of God. We immediately come to him with our insecurities. We got PowerPoint presentations of how God can't use us. We understand the assignment. Oh, the assignment is clear. Go tell Pharaoh, lead them out. But we have questions about the messenger. We have questions about the vessel. And if you could be honest in here, I think a lot of people are secretly asking the question, who am I to do this? It's interesting. I used to think that the only people that asked the who am I questions are the people who had bad, bad insecurity, were the people who had never really stepped into the fullness of their purpose. But can I tell you what I found out? that often is actually the people who have already achieved success. Sometimes it's the people who have already stepped into the fullness of their purpose, and while they're flowing in the purpose, they still have the questions of, who am I? Isn't that crazy that you could get the position that everybody else in the office wants, and here you are, you got it, you got the corner desk, and here you are on the corner desk going, oh, Lord, who am I? It's what psychologists call the imposter syndrome. It's, it's this gnawing feeling on the inside of you that you are not enough and you don't have what it takes. And here's the sad reality of the imposter syndrome. Some people will self-sabotage their own success. Some people will walk away from a position that God rightfully opened up for you. But because the enemy loves to pray in your mind and have you going, who do you think you are? How dare you think you deserve this position? You don't deserve a good marriage. Do you know how many people you've been with? You don't deserve a good friend. You don't deserve to walk in that favor. You don't deserve to walk in that blessing. All the enemy loves to riddle your mind with the pain of who am I? This is where Moses is. He's asking the question, who am I? And I understand why he's asking it. He's asking it because he's been wrestling with it his entire life. From the moment Moses was born, he struggled with his identity. Oh, read it when you get to the crib in Exodus chapter 1. Moses was born into a threat. He was born into a hostile environment. When Moses was born, Pharaoh sent out an edict that every single Hebrew boy should die. He commanded that the midwives, when they were helping the Hebrew women give birth, he said, kill every single baby boy that is born. Born. And I love these midwives because they were gangster. They feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And they said, oh, we can't do it. We can't kill him. He's like, why can't you kill him? He said, you don't understand. These Hebrew women are different. They have the babies too quick. I don't know if that's true or not, but I love that they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And they refused to kill the Hebrew boys. So Pharaoh turns it up a notch. He says, okay, every Hebrew boy that is born, I want you to throw him into the Nile River. This is the climate that Moses was born into. And I say that to tell somebody, when there is purpose, when there is destiny on your life, how many know the enemy does not wait till you're a teenager to start attacking you? 
He starts attacking you from the moment you are in your mother's womb. He wants to start destroying you before you ever get started. Some of you have wondered why there's been so much attack on your life since the moment you were born. The attack is not a sign that God is away from you. The attack is a sign that you have destiny, that there's a call on your life, and the enemy is trying to stop you before you ever get started. He said, kill every single baby boy, throw him in the Nile River, and here is baby Moses born. Oh, and I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Moses, his mama, and his daddy, because Moses was born, and the Bible literally says that they saw he was a beautiful child. He was good looking. You know you're good looking when the Bible says you are a beautiful baby. And they said, this baby is too cute to kill. I can't kill this baby boy. And look at what they do. They take the step of faith and say, we're going to raise this boy. And here they are, obeying God. And their obedience put Moses in an atmosphere of dysfunction. Ooh, I'm going somewhere. You know Moses was born in dysfunction because the Bible says that he was hidden in a house for three months. Anybody in here have a baby or had a baby? Can you imagine trying to hide a baby for three months? Months? Can you imagine the threat? Every time he laughed, shh, shh, don't laugh too much. Every time he cried, here they are, covering his mouth, hiding him maybe under a sink. Imagine the dysfunction that Moses grew up in, in the developmental stages of his life. Here he is. They're trying to preserve him, but he didn't have the vantage point to see what they're doing. All he knows is that I can't cry like a normal baby, and I'm being stuffed in closets, and I'm being stuffed under a sink. Can you imagine the dysfunction Moses grew up in? Finally, he reaches a place where he can be hidden no more. And look at what his mama does. She takes her beautiful baby boy and she says, I'm going to put him in a basket. She wraps up the basket and she prepares the basket. She puts her baby boy in the basket and she trusts the sovereignty and the hand of God and she pushes that boy in the Nile River but in the basket. Isn't that intriguing that the same Nile River that Pharaoh commanded all the baby boys to be thrown into, she did put her baby boy in the Nile River but she just created an ark of protection around him. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to this wasn't in my nose but I came to tell some parent that is your job to create an art of protection around your child through prayer through getting them in the house of God they'll be in the same environment as other kids but they won't have the same outcome and that's how you know the hand of God is really on your life when you float in the same environments that would have killed other people you know God's hand is on you when you are alive in environments that other people drown in how many know that is the protection and the favor of of God. I wish somebody that knows that God protected you in other environments that would have killed other people. You ought to give them some praise of thanksgiving. Other people would have lost their mind if they went through what you went through. But look at you, still standing, still breathing, still giving God the praise in spite of what the enemy tried to do. Woo! Look at baby Moses floating in an environment that other people drowned in. He, he in there, don't even realize a crocodile just passed him. And he is, Cuck -cuck 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 -cuck. as a crocodile is passing him. That's how I feel sometimes with the protection of God. I think heaven's gonna be the revealer of all the different ways God protected me. And I was just, yeah. <laughs> oblivious to his hand, sovereignly. God, I feel your presence sovereignly guiding and that, that, that little basket could have gone anywhere down that river but God just made sure that as soon as Pharaoh's daughter got ready to take a bath here comes the basket of Moses I'm telling you God is sovereign nothing in your life happens by accident it's the divine providence of God look at Pharaoh's daughter I, I think I'll take my bath now right at the time that this basket is pulling up to her. And she opens that basket and sees that little Moses face. He said, this baby too cute to kill. <laughs> Takes the baby boy in, chooses to raise him. It just so happened Moses' sister was around. <sighs> and she says, uh, excuse me, 
do you need a Hebrew mom to nurse that baby? Because I know one. And then Pharaoh's daughter's like, oh, what a coincidence you being right here. I actually do need somebody to nurse him. Would you find me somebody? Moses' sister's like, I know somebody. I'll find him. And then she says, oh, wait, come back, come back. I'll pay her to do it. Moses' mama got paid to nurse the baby that she would have done for free. Oh, that's when you know you're in your purpose. When God actually gives you a paycheck to do the thing that he put you on the earth to do. Oh, let me just testify. I don't preach for money. I'm thankful I get to make a living from this. But if y'all didn't give another check to me, I'd still preach the gospel. I was created to do this right here. But it's a blessing when God actually allows you to get a paycheck to do what you would have done for free. Oh, are y'all recording this? I'm going to watch it later. It's blessing me. <laughs> and she, uh, she bursts him. She raises him. But watch this. She takes her Hebrew boy right back to Pharaoh's daughter. <sighs> so watch this. Moses is born and raised with duplicity. Duplicity of identity. I'm a Hebrew, but I'm in an Egyptian household. And the Egyptians know I'm not an Egyptian. And the Hebrews feel some type of way because I'm eating steak and lobster <laughs> in Pharaoh's house. He's a misfit. He's got duplicity. In his Hebrew household, they understand that there is one God. His name is Yahweh. In his Egyptian household... That polytheistic culture, they got a God for everything. <laughs> in his Egyptian household, they turn it all the way up. In his Hebrew household, they understand Yahweh is God and they worship him. It is duplicity of identity. So imagine going through your teenage years and all the way up to your 40s with this duplicity. Some of you right now are living in the same duplicity. You know how to be Egyptian with the Egyptian crowd? You know how to be Hebrew <laughs> with the Hebrew crowd. When you were with your Egyptian crowd, you know how to talk. You know how they get down. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all been in here before, and it wasn't for a church service. Amen. <laughs> and you know how to get down. You know. <laughs> and then you're in there on Sunday, too, and you know how to worship, too. Isn't it funny how if you're not careful, you'll start living in duplicity. Duplicity. This is why the Bible says in the book of James that a double-minded person is unstable in all of your ways. God said, I'd rather you choose one than to have one foot in the Egyptian world and one foot in the Hebrew world. Why don't you make a decision? See, duplicity will make you make a decision. Sooner or later, you are going to have to make a decision and say, it is for God I live and for God I die. God will not allow in this current climate and culture people to have duplicity. If you're going to be a believer, be a believer and be loud about it. If you're going to live in the world, live in the world and go wild with it. But stop being lukewarm. People ought to know there's something different about your life and not duplicity because duplicity will lead you to make a decision. And Moses, after 40 years of duplicity, he made a decision. It was a moment. I'll tell you the moment he made a decision. It's in Exodus chapter 2. Moses pulls up on an Egyptian and a Hebrew who are fighting. He pulls up on a scenario that is an external picture of what's happening to him internally. The Egyptian and the Hebrew are fighting, which is what is happening within him. There is a war for who he is really going to be. And Moses made a decision. He's like, I'm tired of this. They got me in this house learning all these hieroglyphics, walking around like this, putting this stuff on my head. This is not who I am. I know what my mama raised me to be. I know what my mama called me to be. Yes, I was raised in this Egyptian household. I'm thankful for the education, but that is not who I am. I am a child of God. Oh God, I feel your presence. I don't know who this is for today. But you've been trying to be in the world. You've been trying to be something that you are not. But there's been some grandmama. There's been some mama that was praying for you. You have roots. You have a history in the house of God. And God is calling you to make a decision. <laughs> Moses said, I'm sick of this. I'm a Hebrew. And there they are fighting. 
I got to go save my people. And he jumps in the fight and beats the Egyptian to death. Yo, you know you can fight. <laughs> when you beat somebody to death. Now, this is where I got to make a confession that messed up my study time this week. Okay, because y'all, your boy is raised in church, proud Sunday school alumnus, okay, super saved. Uh, um, didn't, even get, didn't even get to do Halloween as a kid, we had hallelujah night, amen, that's, that's my life, okay. And, and I am familiar with this passage of scripture, very familiar, y'all. I have watched the movie, the old school one with Charlton Heston, the new school one with Prince of Egypt, and y'all, my entire life, I thought that Moses saw the Hebrew and the Egyptian fighting, had a moment of anger, jumped in the fight, and started beating up the Egyptian and just lost control of his rage. And I thought Moses killed him by accident. I thought it was an accident, and so he just ran off because he accidentally killed him. Matter of fact, that's what the cartoon movie Prince of Egypt showed. Watch on Netflix when you get to the crib. Remember what happened? The Hebrew and the Egyptian were fighting on the bridge. Moses got in the middle of it. <laughs> Pushed him. All of a sudden, it was an accident. The Egyptian fell down. Y'all, that's why you got to read the Bible and not watch movies. <laughs> this was not an accident. It's going to mess you up, Jonah. This was not an accident. Let's look at it. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Watch this. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people. Look at that. Ownership. I made a decision. His own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. Here it is. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Y'all, this is premeditated murder. I'm telling you, I watched enough CSI. That's premeditation. Homeboy looked to the right, <laughs> looked to the left and said, oh, he going to die today. Let's go. Ain't no witnesses. Let's go. <laughs> it was premeditation. He decided this was not an accident. He did it. Deeper question. Why? What was he premeditating on before he made this decision? You got to fast forward to the New Testament in Acts chapter 7 where Stephen is giving a defense of the gospel just before he is stoned. And he tells the history of the children of Israel, and he brings up the incident with Moses, and he gives us insight that we don't even get from Mo. Look at it, Acts chapter 7, verse 25. Stephen says, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. Ladies and gentlemen, the burning bush was not the first time Moses felt the call of God on his life. Moses knew long before the burning bush he was called to deliver his people. But what we saw that day when he beat that Egyptian to death was the plan of God executed in human flesh. The plan of God executed your way instead of his way. And how many of you know you cannot accomplish a thing of the spirit by doing it in the flesh? Some of you right now are wondering why there is so much frustration in your life. It's because you are trying to accomplish a legitimate call from God, but you are trying to do it your own way. And whenever you do it your own way, there will always be damage. There will always be carnage. There will always be shame and hurt. Let's just analyze it. Moses, you're called to deliver millions of people. But since you're trying to do it in your own strength, guess how many you delivered? One. <gasps> he delivered one Hebrew, killed the Egyptian, and he delivered the wrong one. Because the next day, all of a sudden, two Hebrews are fighting, and Moses goes to break up the fight, and somebody speaks up and says, oh, what you going to do? Kill us the same way you killed that Egyptian the other day? Hold up, hold up. I thought he looked to the left and looked to the right and there were no witnesses. <laughs> that means, <gasps> that means the dude that he saved went and snitched. I'm gonna say 
save your life and you're going to go tell on me? He should have killed him too and buried him. <laughs> Leave nobodies. He told. And now it's Moses on the run from God because he tried to do it in his own strength. I wonder who in here today is on the run. Because you had a legitimate call on your life. But you did it in your own strength and in your own way. And when God invites you to participate in his purpose and his plan, it must be his way, not yours. Moses is on the run. You can play bear and make this sound real spiritual. I love God. <laughs> Because even in our running, he knows where we're supposed to end up. Moses goes on the run, and notice where his running leads him to. Not to Maui. It leads him to Midian. If I had time, I would really go deep into that. But Midian translates to mean place of strife. Midian is the place where you're on the run from God, and God humbles you and matures you at the same time. For 40 years, this prince of Egypt is in Midian watching stanky sheep. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. He's no longer with his attendants in Pharaoh's house. He's on the backside of a desert for 40 years because God knows how to humble you. He knows how to mature you and grow you up. Here's Moses fetching water for sheep and leading them in the wilderness, thinking that my life is over. If God was going to use me, he would have used me when I was 40. But now I'm just out here with these stanky sheep in Midian. Just like some of you feel like that. God's done with you. That maybe God could have used you before the mistake before the bankruptcy, before the affair, before the addiction. But God sent me on assignment to tell you he still invites you into his purpose and into his plan. And he is sovereign and he's not done with you yet. I love it because Moses is wandering in Midian, watching stanky sheep, thinking it's just going to be an ordinary day. And in classic God fashion, he doesn't warn Abraham and say, get ready, something big's about to happen. God moments never happen like that. Have you noticed? God moments don't give you a warning in advance. They just happen. And as Moses is walking, he looks in his peripheral and sees a bush that is on fire and burning. That wasn't unusual. All the time throughout the desert because of the climate, bushes would combust but then the fire would be quick and go out but Moses noticed wait a minute that fire is burning and burning and burning and, and burnt it should it should be burnt up but it's still burning why is it st it's still burnt this is not natural this is supernatural if that bush is burning and still burning that means it's not the bush that's keeping the fire going there's something else that's keeping the fire burning this must be a supernatural sign because that would have been burnt up by now how in the world is it still burning maybe because God himself is this has to be God doing something because it's still burning. And notice what he does. He goes over to get a closer look. Please don't miss this. God does not speak to Moses from the bush to get his attention. God noticed, Moses noticed the burning bush and then he spoke. He did not speak to get his attention. He got his attention, and when he paid attention, God spoke. Let me show it to you right here in the text. Watch this. It says, when the Lord saw 
that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. In other words, God says, if you notice the signs I'm giving you and you'll actually pay attention, then I will speak to you. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I came to tell you, God is trying to get your attention. You want him to speak to get your attention, but first he wants to see if he can get your attention, and if he can get your attention, then he would speak. Some of you, this message right now is a burning bush. It is God trying to get your attention. That's why the enemy wants you wasting your life on social media, looking at everybody else's life, because he knows if God can ever get your attention, he will change the direction of your life. He wants to notice if you'll notice the sign he's given you. You think this is random that you're in the same place that you were at a concert in and God is speaking to you? You think it's random that somebody just sent you a text and said, come to Deep Ellum today? No, no, no. That is a burning bush. God is trying to get your attention. If he could get your attention, he'll speak. And once Moses noticed what God was doing, look at what God says to him. He says, Moses, Moses. I'm thankful for a God that knows my name. When I'm wrestling with who I am, he knows me and he'll call my name not just once, but twice. Moses, Moses, take off your sandals because the place you're standing on is holy ground. I'm sorry. Y'all more spiritual than me, but if that was me, and I was in the wilderness in Midian with stanky sheep dung around me. And God has the nerve to say, this <laughs> is holy ground. I would say, how? <laughs> this don't smell like holy ground. <laughs> this don't look like holy ground. How is the wilderness with stanky sheep around me and I've missed my purpose and it feels like all hope is lost? How is this holy ground? Moses is holy ground because my presence is here. And whenever God's presence shows up in any place, ordinary becomes holy when his presence shows up. Can I tell you, the factory today is holy ground. It seems like it's another venue, no. But when his presence shows up, how many of you know the ordinary becomes holy when God's presence shows up? That means no matter where you are and no matter what season you're in, you ought to always invite God's presence in that place. You know why? The ordinary becomes holy when his presence shows up. I wish I had somebody that knew that today. I dare you to get up on your feet and lift up your hands like you know that this is holy ground. God, we invite you to invade our ordinary, invade every space, invade every place. Because when God shows up in the ordinary, the ordinary becomes holy ground. It's holy ground. Hear me? I can't wait till God blesses social with a building. We're still analyzing and still getting all the offers and still doing everything that we can. And I'll be honest, there's sometimes it looks like it just seems like a massive mountain that can't be moved. But can I tell you what I've learned to love in the process as we go from venue to venue is watching ordinary spaces become holy ground as God is lifted up in every sector in this city, as God is exalted in Deep Ellum and exalted at Fair Park and exalted on Strauss Square, that everyone knows who our God is. Maybe the ground you're standing on you think is ordinary but it's only ordinary because you haven't invited his presence into the ordinary if you invite his presence in the ordinary watch it become holy ground says, Moses this is holy ground I'm calling you not because I need you but because I want to participate with you and Moses response to God was this. Who am I? Just keep it on that screen. Who am I? That's the question that you've been asking. Who am I to do this, God? Who am I that you would use me with my past? Who am I? And what trips me out is God never answered his question. Never answered it. If I'm God, 
And Moses hits me with that, who am I? I give him a pep talk, like, come on, buddy. <laughs> You're my child. <laughs> You're awesome. You look good. You've been cute since you were a baby. He doesn't get that pep talk from God. God ignores the question. He just says, I'm with you. Then Moses has another question. Okay, okay, okay. Suppose I go. Who do I say sent me? God goes, oh, I got to answer that question. He says, tell them I am that I am. I am sent you. Moses had to be going, what does that mean? It means that I am every single thing that you need. See, many of us are like Moses. You worried about the who in the am I. But God says your answer is in the question. It's not about the who am I. It's about the I am. Because if you got the I am, it don't matter who you are. The I am is the one that sent you. The I am is the one that will be with you. And the reason I got to just say I am is because I'm every single thing that you're going to need along the journey. I can be a pillar of fire by night. I can be a cloud by day. I can be water from a rock. I can be bread that comes down. I'm your provider. I'm your protector. I'm your peace. I'm your joy. I'm your life. I'm your deliverer. I am every single thing that you need. I am that I am. Confession. I'm tired of obsessing with who am I. I got to start obsessing with I am. The great I am. I'm tired of obsessing about all of my insecurities and insufficiencies and giving God PowerPoint presentations on why he can't use me. He never answered the who am I. All he said is, I'm with you. And tell them I am sent you. That's enough. Last illustration, I'm done. Anybody in here ever ordered anything off a of DoorDash? Can I see your hand? My, look at all y'all do. Any of you cook? My Lord. Anything off of Uber Eats? Okay. All right. Um, have you ever in your life wanted more details about the person that was delivering your food? Have you ever in your life said, well, I need a thorough background check on the person that's bringing this Chipotle before they bring it? No, all you know is you are hungry and you just need them to understand the assignment and bring, you don't even care what kind of car they drive in or if they're on a scooter. Just deliver the thing that my soul has been hungry for and I came to tell you I am is enough. You worried about your record and your past and what you've done wrong? It's not about you. It's about the God that's flowing through you the I am the answer is in the question it's not who am I it's the I am and as every head be bowed and eyes be closed today Father thank you for your word Lord this is holy ground Lord a venue has all kinds of concerts and events, but today, it's holy ground. Lord, I'm praying for my brother and my sister who you've been calling. Some of them feel just like Moses. They've known there's a call on their life, but they feel like it's too late. Lord, I'm praying today you would remind them that it is never too late. That as long as there is breath in our body, that as long as we have a pulse, we still have a purpose. And you can accomplish your plan in us and through us. Father, we thank you that you even would invite us <laughs> to participate in your purposes and plan in the earth. God, you don't need us, you're sovereign. But Lord, thank you that you invite us to participate. So Lord, I pray strength and courage to the heart that feels like it's too late. Let them know that you want to do something in them and through them for your glory and yours alone. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed all over this place today. But if you'd be so honest to say, you know what? I've been running from the call. 
Maybe your way of running is you've been trying to do it in your own strength. How's that going for you? Moses, who was called to deliver millions when he tried to do it in his own strength, only to deliver to one and ended up on the run. I say that to say you don't have a clue what God would do in you and through you if you would just submit your life to him. So I first want to pray for those of you who you've been on the run from God's call on your life and this message today is your burning bush. Is God calling you back? Saying take off your shoes which is a sign of humility. He says God I'm going to do it your way. And I'm going to follow your purpose. I'm going to accept the invitation to participate with you. If that's you and you know you've been on the run from a call, would you lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I could see it? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you that you know every single person. You know them by name. God, you know the pain. You know the struggles. And you're able to even use all of that to accomplish your purpose. Anybody else lift it up and put it right back down. Thank you, Jesus. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you're in here today and maybe you're watching online and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, this would be a great day to say, Lord, I'm yours. Hear me, God is sovereign. He rules and he reigns. But he does give you the opportunity to respond to him. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor Robert, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus, but today I need to give him my life. Or maybe there was a season you were running after the things of God, but your heart's gotten so cold. And today you just need to rededicate, recommit your life to him. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I can see it? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. I see those hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I want to do. I just believe that this is a burning bush moment for somebody. And so if you lifted up your hand that second time saying, I need to give him my life, or I need to rededicate my life to him, I would not want to rob you of an opportunity to show physically that you're responding to God. So here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to count to three, and if you lifted up the, your hand that second time saying, I'm giving him my life, I just want you to get out of your seat and come right up here to the front. Can God meet you at your seat? Absolutely. But I just think it's something powerful about getting away from where you are and saying, that old me that was running from God is at my seat but the new me is ready to step into what God has for me come on this altar at the front is holy ground some people are already coming come on if you lifted up your hand you should I want you to come one two come on three if you're at the top and you got to come all the way down trust me it's worth it it's worth it come on this is your day come on this is your savior calling you saying come home come home come home I promise you it's worth the walk I promise you it's worth the walk. This is your God calling your name the same way he called Moses his name and said, I see you. It's not too late. I got a plan. I got a purpose. I got a call on your life. I got something I want you to do. I don't need you, but I want you. I want you. Come on, church. Don't stop clapping until people stop coming. This is a big deal. People are responding today. Come on, anybody else, I don't care if you got to walk all the way from the top and come down. The day you hear God's voice, respond to Him. Respond. Come on, let's worship as they're still coming. Come on, He's worthy. your hands as they respond come on come on this king is worthy of it all he's worthy of all of your life Let's keep declaring it. He's worthy. He 
He's worthy of it all. for somebody else to respond because I know how the enemy works he loves to echo that question that's in your mind of who are you he specializes in making you think that it is too late and it is over Moses thought it was too late he was 80 years old when God met him in that wilderness and God said even at 80 it's not too late. And so I just want to pause in this moment and give somebody else an opportunity to respond because the enemy has told you, no, it's too late. You can't go down there to the front and you know God is speaking to your heart. And I came to tell you the devil is a liar. It's not too late. I stopped this moment to invite you to come because your father is calling you. He wants to partner with you to accomplish his plan, his purpose in the earth. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, yeah. Come on, anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you that it's never too late. God, thank you that you don't give up on us. God, thank you that you give us chance after chance after chance after chance. Thank you, God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hear me, you don't have a clue. You don't have a clue who's on the other side of your surrender of your yes I'm not making this up when God called us to plant this church my response was no who am I I had no clue this was on the other side of answering and every single day it is a day of saying God I don't feel like I'm enough who am I but I've stopped focusing and put my focus on the I am and the I am in me is enough I am is with you and will be with you everywhere you go and is able, hear me to use every single thing that you've been through for his glory don't let the enemy beat you upside the head with shame. God knows how to let the enemy get your bad news out there. So when God does that transformation in your life, people go, Are, is that the same one that used to be depressed that we can't stop from smiling? Yeah. Is that the same one that used to be out there in them streets? Now has a family? Absolutely. I'm the same one. I'm telling you, your thing that the enemy is trying to beat you up with shame can become the platform that you declare the goodness of the I am. It's for his glory. you let these church people fool you I know sometimes they get in church and act like they're in the witness protection program they told their real testimony you would be shocked of what God brought them out of don't you ever come in the house of God and feel like you got to be perfect ain't no perfect people in here we have our eyes fixed on the perfect one who is the I am he's the great I am so here's what I want us to do just right here in this holy moment as we stand on holy ground would you just lift up your hands we're all going to do it but especially those of you who came to the front to respond would you just say this prayer I'm going to give you the words but you say it from your heart say Jesus I need you Lord today I surrender Lord I know you have called me 
You love me so much. But you lived the life that I was supposed to live. You died the death that I was supposed to die. Jesus, you took my place. So my response is to surrender. And I stand here today on this holy ground. It seems ordinary, but your presence is here. So it's holy. So I ask you, forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new from this moment forward. I'm walking with you. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, somebody make the devil mad and just give God the best hand clap and shout of praise that you got. No, I mean tear the roof off the factory with your praise in this place today. The great I am deserves a great praise. Father, we magnify you. We lift you up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we get to participate in your plan and your purposes in the earth. Thank you, Jesus.